is our third talk in this identity series. Yes. And today is entitled, Chosen in Christ. Now, feedback. <laughs> yeah, some moves. That's good. Uh, how, how many of you guys have heard that phrase if you've been in church? Like you've probably heard it whenever you hear the Bible read, especially in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, for some of you, maybe not. You're like, ah, I don't know. Um, maybe. Maybe just it didn't uh, register. Or maybe you haven't been to church a lot and it's just kind of like, no, I don't know what it is. Well, hopefully today we'll find just a, a small part of what it is because it's it is one of the most incredible things in all of Scripture. And it applies to you if you're a follower of Jesus. It's incredible. Chosen in Christ. All right, so really quick recap of where we've been so we can land where we are. So we've been on this trek of identity, trying to discover who you really are. And so the question is, like, how do you know who you are? Right? You can look at yourself in the mirror. You can you know, evaluate your skills or the way you look or whatever. But is that who you are? Is that really who you are? Like, how do you figure that stuff out? And you guys are all kind of in that stage where, um, you know, you're, you're all asking those questions. You're, you're developing, you're becoming an adult, you know, imminently. As a dad, I know how fast that happens now. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's, it's crazy. But you, you're on this, on this path of trying to discover your identity. Like, who am I really? And so that's what this whole series is meant to do. It's to, to ask, answer some of these questions. And so um, next week, we're going to talk a little bit more technically. Like, well, how do you do this? Uh, like this. Like, how do you actually discover who you really are? Like, what's the process? Like, you know, there's so many uh, ways out there in the world that, around us. <clears throat> uh, what does, and then what does God have to say about your identity? Well, that's kind of what the whole series is about. We want to figure that out. So we're going to talk about that a lot. And one of them is chosen in Christ, which is today. What is our society, schools, media, um, friends, parents, people around you that know you? Um, you know, who do, they, who do they think you are? And how do they, like, how does our society or how does the world say, this is how you find your identity? Usually it's like you have to find yourself, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to go there today. That's next week. Um, this is, sounds kind of funny. But inside, we are all like, well, yeah, it sounds funny, but it isn't. It's, there's something serious about that. How do, you, how do you figure out who you are? And then why is this important when it comes to following Jesus? Why do you need to know your identity? Why do you need to figure this out? Okay, so what, this is where we've been so far. We talked about the war for your identity, talk number one, that these, there's two main enemy tactics, and if it's all involving deceit. Now he has lots of more tactics, but we're just honing in on a couple. Uh, the first one is he wants, to, he wants to warp or trick or deceive you about who God is. That is one of his primary objectives. Because if he can deceive you about who God is, because you're created in his image, then he can deceive you about your identity. And secondly, oh, sorry. And, and it all comes down to this kind of one thing. That God is not enough. So he's not good enough. He's not powerful enough. Meaning like he's not able so even if he is good, he's not powerful enough, doesn't care enough, whatever it is, God isn't enough. And in today's, it might be like, well, God isn't enough to make me happy. So <laughs> where do you go with that, right? But that's always the lie. God isn't enough. And that one's a pretty blatant lie, but, you know, our enemy is very good at lying. <laughs> And so we fall for even these lies that when we say it out loud, that God isn't enough, what? Of course he is, right? In our minds. But that's not how we feel often. And we have lots and lots of doubts when it comes to, is he really enough? I mean, we, from time to time, we will doubt his existence. Everyone does at some point. Now, it might be a little doubt. But <laughs> but, and some people really struggle through that. And there are times in your life where you're going like, is this just all a sham? Is this just like a big 
thing I've kind of fallen for and just grew up in. And those are not bad things, necessarily, unless that's your excuse to kind of throw it all away. But what, what that's meant to do, what those doubts and the, that, those hard thoughts are meant to do is actually help you to start thinking about it, to looking into God. Well, what does God say about it? And how does this fit? Why am I not experiencing this in my life? <laughs> you know, asking those hard questions. And then wrestling with that truth. Because this will always be underlying every lie about God, that he, somehow he's not enough. All right. Secondly, and this, this, is, this is one that's, a product of the first one, too, is that the second one is he wants to deceive you about who you are. See, our enemy hates God. And I don't know if he cares, or I don't, th- I don't know if he hates us. All I know is that he hates what God loves because he hates God. And he wants to hurt God. And so he is looking to twist and warp your identity. That's why we're doing this series. It is so hard and it's a lifelong thing. There'll be, there'll be so- times of smooth sailing when you're like, ah, finally, I have this, I'm secure in Christ. Like I, I understand who I am. And then all of a sudden it'll blow up because the enemy will never give up on trying to deceive you about your identity because it's so core to you living out your faith and living for Jesus. Like it, you, you can't separate them. They're just, they're linked, fused. And so this follow-up question is often uh, about who you are, is that you're not enough. And we've talked quite a bit about this, so I don't want to, like, it's so important, but I, I don't want to, like, we already have actually talked about it for two weeks. But it's, it's just so common, and it slips in everywhere. And you got to ask the question, like, enough for what? Like, who's, whose expectations are we trying to live up to here? And so what he wants to do is twist it so that you think it's God's expectation or God's thought or accusation that you're not enough. It's not. God knows. He knows we're not enough. He made us. That's what we talked about last week. So you are made in God's image. All humans have value because we're made in God's image. That's why uh, life is so important in the Christian faith. That's why, you know, Christians started hospitals. Christians started uh, feeding the poor. Christians start, like all those things are started by Christians. Why? It's because all humans have value. And God loves people. And we were made in his image. And, he, and this, this was one of the cool things from that talk. You are his masterpiece. This is fabulous language. And then uh, last week, you are fully known and deeply loved. Two really core needs that we just, we really want to be known. But there's so much fear in us that, man, if people really knew who I was, they'd be, or how I think, or whatever it is, I'd be gone. They'd be like, whoa even though they're like that too. <laughs> We'd all pretend. Right? It's just this, that, that thought's just in there. And, and, but God's not like that. And hopefully the church isn't supposed to be like that either. We're not supposed to, to be like that, right? But God's not like that. He just deeply, deeply loves you. And he knows you completely. He knows you better. Remember Psalm 139? He knows the words before you say it. Wow. That's how well he knows you and loves you fully. And we're going to continue that theme of love today a little bit. Because, man, God's motivation for choosing you is love. It's always love. It always comes down to love. All right. So uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read just a few verses here and just go through them. And then we'll, we'll break into small groups. So chosen in Christ is the theme. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, I'm just going to read verses 3 to 8. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Seriously? Do you guys hear that? How many spiritual blessings? (laughs) 
<laughs> every wow like Paul's not holding back here he's like he's given us every spiritual blessing wow in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ so we are in that's what it means united Christ means we are in Christ even before he made the world wow God loved us you guys catch that? Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. We'll, we'll discuss that because that one's like, what? <laughs> Seriously? God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. So what did God want to do? Adopt us into his family, right? You guys with me? <laughs> All right, let's do it. God decided in advance to adopt us <clears throat> into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Oh, so that's why we're in Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Just let that sit for a bit. This is what God wanted. You know, we think about what Jesus went through on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, which is death. And this is what God wants. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. What? We're going we're gonna to have to Figure that one out, right? We'll do that in a couple minutes. Let's keep going. So we praise God for the glory, glorious grace that <clears throat> sorry, he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. You know, capital S, right? It's Jesus. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. There we go. He has showered his kindness on us. Okay. Paul's using some metaphors here. Whenever you find a, a metaphor in the Bible, it's, a, it's an indicator to turn your imagination on. Okay? So, turn your imagination on. <laughs> what does a kindness shower look like? Anybody? Just, what comes to mind? Say it. It's, there's no wrong answer. I'm asking you what comes to your mind when he gives this metaphor that God's kindness is a shower. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Hearts. Definitely a girl. I didn't even think. What? Someone bring me food. <laughs> nice. So like steak coming out of the <laughs> steak shower. What's that, what's that cartoon? Something Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Yeah. There we go. Anyone else? What comes to mind? Pure gold? What? There you go. Anyone else? Keep, you guys can just say it. So use your imaginations. It's giving us a metaphor. That's what we're supposed to do. Imagine. For me, it's just like some kind of something warm and refreshing and just makes me feel so good. Doesn't that happen when someone's super kind? It's like showering us. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we, we, sorry, we got to keep going. So I just, we got to kick in our imagination here. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. That's a lot. All, right? All wisdom and understanding. All right, let's get to it here, guys. What in the world is Paul telling us here? Or telling the Ephesians that we get to, that we get to know as well. So three things, <clears throat> surprise, surprise. Number one, God chose you. That's what we get from this passage, right? You have been adopted by God into his family. So many years ago, my wife and I made a trek to Taiwan. We had been in contact with this little boy. He was uh, just a wee baby. And his foster parents at the time, because 
um, he was not thriving in the orphanage, and so they needed to put him in a home. And so it was actually a missionary couple there that took him, um, took him into their home until we came to pick him up. And so uh, the process lasted a long time. Some of it because, well, I really didn't do my homework at all. <laughs> my wife did all the homework. And it was like, there was all these hoops and steps and things you thought you had to get through. And then we actually did, because there was two governments that had, you know, we have this government and this government needs this and this government was like, whoa, this is crazy. We just want, we just, we've said yes to this little boy. We just want to bring him home. And so anyway, it took a long time and it, se it seemed like an eternity. And then all of a sudden the day was there and, uh, Oh, Rick and Corrine, I, I think, took care of the kids. Did you get to take care of them the whole time, or was it tag team? Oh, yes, the Rashkis. And so uh, Jamie and I went, and I remember walking down the street toward this, little, this door. And I saw this little... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't think this would happen. I, I saw Tiffany was her name, and she was holding Titus. And I saw him with my, like, because we'd seen him on um, FaceTime, but this was, I saw him in person, saw him. I'm like, wow, that's him. And it was just in awe. And I just, I'll never forget that moment that I saw him. So we walked in, and I'm like, you know, this kid's, <laughs> You know, he's going to, he grew up in an orphanage, hardly knows any, any males, uh, but he was in a family, so that, I don't know why I was thinking that, but in the orphanage, it was all females. And so I just thought, like, he won't, it'll take a long time for him to connect with me. But I had a camera, <laughs> one of those, you know, DSLRs, big camera. And so uh, he was very interested. And I remember, I'm sitting on this couch, and I'm looking at this little guy, and he's looking up at me, and he's, I'm like, something's happening. So it was more than the camera, there was a connection made there. And I was just floored, I could not believe it. The love I had in my heart for that little guy was just, it, I, it was kind of, I can't really explain it. And we got to choose him. It was, it was amazing. It's not, my other kids aren't here today. so We got to choose him. And we didn't, we, you know, anyway, we'll just keep going. <laughs> and uh, I think the reason I'm a little bit emotional, cause, because look at him today. Like he's 11. He is the coolest little boy on the planet. Like he's... Um, He's amazing. And I love him a lot. And the reason I tell you that story is because I want you to know that that's what God has done for you. He came a long way, and it wasn't, you know, we just came from, we went from Cold Lake to, to Taiwan. Jesus came from heaven to earth. He came a long way because that was the price, that was the cost of adoption. For us, it was just money, time, stress. <laughs> For Jesus, it was everything. And in the end, it was his life. When it says that God took great pleasure, that should hit us deep. That cements your identity. That's one of those moments that you go like, yeah. I may not feel like that right now, and I don't feel like it lots, but I need to be reminded of God's love. That's what the motivation always is, of God's love, that he would adopt us and bring us into his family. So Titus, is, he's a nickel. Like he's, he's my boy. He's one of ours. Like I don't even, I, I forget that he's adopted most times. I don't um, he's just my son. And he didn't do anything to try to earn it. And
And so I, when you think about who you are and your identity, this is why this is so important. You are his adopted son or daughter. You belong to him. He chose you. He's adopted you. If you've said yes to Jesus and you're a follower of Jesus, you've become a Christian. That's you. You belong to him. You belong to his family. And in our passage, it tells us that we've been set apart for God's love and grace to be poured out on you. <laughs> this is, blows me away. Again, just thinking of, of Titus. That's, that's what happened when we adopted him. That that's, our love gets to get poured out on him. Unfortunately for him, also our other stuff, right? <laughs> but God is perfect. And his love and grace gets to be poured out on us. He set us aside for this very thing, or set apart, sorry. And then to, to understand, or, you know, I said we get to this in a few minutes, to realize that this was God's idea from the beginning. This wasn't kind of like, what should we do with these people? <laughs> right? Or like, no, no, now what are we going to do? Or just kind of an afterthought, oh, I know what we can do. <laughs> no, that's not what it was. Before the beginning of the world, God had planned this all out, that he would have a family, that his created beings, humans, would have the opportunity to become part of his adopted family from the beginning. Isn't that amazing? This is God's plan from the beginning. So this is, a, I would say this is more of a corporate, corporate meaning God's people, not just individual. Like he's, I don't think he's specifically talking about individuals. But people include individuals, do they not? <laughs> yeah? And so in verse 4, what does it say? Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. So I think it is us, because it says us. But you... There's a you and us, is there not? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. God had you in mind too. It wasn't just faceless, you know, people, <laughs> stick figures that he was thinking of. No, he knew you. And from last week, before you were created, he knew it. He knew you. All right. God chose you. Secondly, God takes great pleasure in you. And I hope the, the story helps. Um, of adopting Titus. Uh, but I have another story. It's a personal story as well. Uh, this one is not sad. So <laughs> how many of you guys like dogs? What? That's it? Oh, okay. I was just like, maybe I should not tell this one. <laughs> okay. For those of you who have dogs, when you come home, what does your dog do? He spazzes out. Why? Uh, I think there's more to it. She's excited, right, to see you. Please forgive me for this analogy. <laughs> I, I, I thought about it for a little while, and I'm like, I'm not sure I should use this. But I'm like, this is such a cool picture. So when I come home, our little dog is so excited to see me. He's redefined what, I, what the, a text like this makes me think of when God says he takes great pleasure in something. So when I come home, my, my little dog is, he's dancing, he's running in circles, he is so excited, he's pushing me with his little paws, because he's not very big, right? So he's like, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> right? But he's just so excited. Now this is where I said, forgive me for, but I, I, this, I think it's a cool analogy. If it's not, tell me after and go like, don't use that one again. Okay. It's a little bit like God when we kind of come home or spend time with him. Now, I'm not saying he's like a wild animal, <laughs> crazy, but the passion that is in that little dog, that desire, that great pleasure, that's like, I think that's a gift from God. I think that's something that, that's in God that he gave to our little dogs, our big dogs. They're so excited. God's excited to be with you. Like, it's hard to think about that, right? Like, God is in the little dog. 
And yet, that exc- how much more excited can you get? And I'm like, God's more excited than that. What? God takes great pleasure in you. So really, does he, does he, does he really? Or is it just in the us together, not individuals? I think it's both, by the way. It, for sure, it's both, right? So this is how he keeps going in verse 4. God chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now, I've heard this said, and I've said it before, I'm pretty sure, that God doesn't, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. It's actually not right. <laughs> That's not what he sees. He sees, and it's united, the word united up here, we are united with Christ. He sees you in Christ and Christ in you. So it's not that he doesn't see the negative, right? It's not like that he's partially blind or chooses not to see. He knows you. That's why we started with he knows, knows you. So he's not pretending. He's not turning a blind eye and saying, I only see Jesus. No, he sees us both. But because we are in Christ, and this is super important, that changes everything. You are in Christ. You are united with Christ. And he is in you. It's so awesome. That is why. Not only that, God sees the person you're becoming. Not just who you think you are at the moment. Because we tend to focus on our faults. (laughs) Right? And God isn't focusing on your faults, like especially like we are, or like you do, or me do, or I do. He's not, he's not like fixated on that. That's why we often push back against the idea that God can take pleasure in us because we have so many faults. How can, but God's not like us in that way. And this is just amazing. And so God sees you. He sees you. And he sees you without fault. And it's not, it's not only that he's seeing what you're becoming either. He sees you today and he sees who you were. He knew you from beginning to end. Psalm 139, right? From before you were born. So this is a super important idea, you guys. You guys need to, th- like when you're struggling with who you are and how God sees you, you need to see, you need to remember this. He sees you in Christ and Christ in you. He sees both. And what, of course, this whole idea of, and we're going to get to it in a minute, I mean, Jesus changed everything. See, we've been reunited with God in, you can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let's keep going. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. And that was just the sweetest verse. I had to read it again. That's why I put it in the notes to read it again. It is awesome. I love it. You can memorize that one, too, if you want. It's one of those good ones. You're like, oh, they're all good, sorry. <laughs> it's one of those ones sometimes you need to bring up uh, more often. This is why Jesus came. Paul is exposing God's motivation here. He wanted to bring us to himself. In other words, why did God do this? Because he wants, he wanted to be with us. It's God's right from the start with Adam and Eve in the garden. God wanted to be with us, his people, his family. This is what he wanted and it gave him great pleasure. Oh, yeah, last one. We got to, we got to hit, get to small group here. The last one, and this is, this is where it all comes like going like, oh yeah, this is super significant. All that is, is nice, but God was willing to pay the price for you, right? We had to, we had to pay like dollars and we had to pay like other stuff. <laughs> we had to sacrifice, right, to get Titus. Jesus had to sacrifice everything right from beginning to end until he sacrificed his own life. That was the price, and Jesus paid it. 
That's why we're back to the gospel. Always a constant reminder of how great God's love is for you. To understand that, it, that God was doing all of this because it gave him great pleasure. And you're like, what? We're going to have, you know, Good Friday here in a, was it a month? Two months? And we're going to be like, and it's sad and it's hard. And we're like, I can't believe they did that to Jesus. I guess I did that to Jesus too. <laughs> it was my sin. But at the same time, it's just kind of like God's great pleasure. He wanted to do this. He was willing to sacrifice his own son so he could be with us in relationship with us. So the, the barrier between him and us could be removed by Jesus. And God's on a mission because Jesus' death is incredibly meaningful for all people, the Bible says. All people. The Bible also says that God desires that all people would be saved. Why is that? Because the sacrifice paid was the greatest sacrifice you could possibly make, right? If you're thinking of the most expensive thing ever, that's what Jesus bought. <laughs> and there was only one thing he could possibly give in order to buy it. It was his, it was his life. And so the reason is, is God's, he wants to reconcile the relationship. He wants to set it right again. And Jesus did that. It's God's big invitation, right? Reconciliation. In fact, the Bible says, Paul says actually in, I think it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, one of the Corinthians, that uh, we are agents of reconciliation. I'm like, ooh, that's kind of cool. So in my imagination, there's imagination talk again, I'm like, undercover agent. <laughs> it's just my, my imagination. And I'm thinking of the guy with the hat and the, this is terrible. It's not what Paul's thinking about at all. <laughs> But kicks in my imagination. Yeah, an agent. I'm working for someone. But this agent isn't undercover. This is like a, the open agent because we want everyone to know the love of God. We want everyone to get the shower of kindness and grace that he has on his people. And someday we'll all, we'll all stand before him and we will be overwhelmed. We're be, we'll be like, I never knew this much love could ever happen. Like, I, I just think we'll just melt from his love. Like, it'll just radiate. And it'll just be like, <laughs> be like, ah, I'm not worthy of your love. And he'll be like, yeah, you are. And so he's done this for us. And so he wants us to do it for others. Right? We've experienced all of this goodness from God and he wants us to share it. He wants us to, to be on that mission with him, to seek and save the lost so that people can have right relationship with, with God so they can be with him and he can be with them too. Okay, right. there's a, a little slice of what it looks like to be in Christ. So this is a word, this is a phrase that's used a ton in the New Testament. And so Paul just gives us a, a little window here that is just fabulous. And so here we go, the end of this talk. You were chosen by God. I hope that means something different to you now. I hope there's some significance it may not have had before you came in today. That's, that's my prayer for you. That was my hope from the start. I want this to impact you differently when you think that you're chosen. It's not just words. There's something incredibly significant. And then followed up by our two questions for this series. Who gets to decide who you are? Our passage today said that we belong to God. And so in the end, the second question is, who are you going to believe? Because the world's telling you something different. And that's next week's talk. We're going to get into, well... How are we being discipled <laughs> by our world and how to, how to find our identity? All right, but that's, uh, that's ne next week. 
So let me pray for you, and we'll, uh, we'll go to small group.